Hi everybody, my name is Mark and I'm so glad that you are here, whether you're watching with us live on Sundays or on YouTube throughout the week. I just want you to know that you're welcome here and this place exists for you. If we haven't met before or we haven't chatted, I would love to get to know you a little bit. You can text our team here at 650-600-0402 and I'd love to connect with you. Grab a cup of coffee if you're local or get you any resources that you might need to get you to where you want to go. Now, before we jump into today's ser service, where we're continuing our Hearing God series, which is all about knowing how to hear God's voice, how to discern that, and then how to act. Great series. I want you to make sure that you go onto your phone and you go on to wherever you get podcasts and you check out the Menlo Sermon Podcast. We do a sermon podcast, we do a Menlo Midweek podcast, and from now until when our new senior pastor, Phil, starts teaching in a couple series, we're gonna get time with Phil in a standalone podcast with him. So that is your chance to get to know him. That's our chance to get to know and conversate and learn more about Phil, what he does, what his vision is, and just some fun things about him. So make sure you check that out. And now let's jump into the service. Well, good morning, Menlo Church. It's great to have you here. Let's all stand up together.
Amen. Thank you, Lord. We taught a brand new song last week. It's called Song of Praise, a song I wrote a few months ago. And so we're going to do it again. We'd love for you to sing along with us. this morning. Thank you that you are the Lord over all, that you're mighty to save, Lord, that you're a father who knows us by name and that you speak to us and you long for us to hear your voice and to follow you. God, thank, th thank you that you're good and that you're patient, that you're loving and compassionate, all of these things and more. Lord, we give you worship. We give you our praise this morning from our hearts and off of our lips to you, the only one who's worthy of our worship. And we pray all this in your name, Jesus. Everyone said together, amen. Great to worship with you all. You can have a seat. All right. Well, like, welcome to uh, Menlo Church, a place where everybody's welcome, nobody's perfect, and anything is possible because God's spirit is here in our midst and God is living and active and at work today. My name is Mark. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, I'd love to a chance to, to meet you personally. Uh, those of you who are watching us online, whether you are here in the Bay Area, maybe attend one of our other campuses normally, uh, you just stayed home in the rain this morning, uh, we're just glad you're a part of our community here as well. Uh, but it is, uh, it is a joy to be able to gather together as, as part of the body of Christ, and it's something we don't want to take for granted. Uh, we're here to help people take, uh, take next steps and, and get connected in this new year. Uh, maybe God is kind of nudging you to say, hey, I, I want to get better connected. I, I want to find some deeper community, build some new friendships in, 
this church and maybe find some new ways to serve or to be involved. Uh, we have different ways to do that. One is by the Connect card. If you're technologically minded, you can scan the QR code at the back of the pews and uh, just let us know how we can help you get connected. You can stop by and visit the folks at our Info Central uh, out here at the corner and let them know. Or if you're online, you can go to menlo.church slash connect card. And just let us know how we can serve you, help you get connected here. Uh, Another great way to get connected is through Starting Point. You've heard me talk about that in the past. It's kicking off Tuesday, January 24th for four weeks. And it's for folks newer to our church, but not only. Last week, I had somebody at our 830 service say, you know, I've been coming to this church for 10 years but I really feel like I want to make some new connections and meet some new people and find some new ways to serve in the church. Can I come? And of course, I said no. Uh, No, I I said yes, absolutely you come. This is just to help you take a next step. So I hope to see you there. But here's a video so you can hear it from some people who've taken part in Starting Point before. We're looking for community in Starting Point. And the beginning of building our Menlo community was there. Um, I've been going to Menlo for a little while, but um, it's one thing to go somewhere, but it's nothing when you start to become part of community. And I think Starting Point provided a really good way to ease into meeting new people. Everybody is there with the same intention and having that environment in which to be able to do that is really special and really fun. We went, we are new to the church and um, we didn't know that many people and Starting Point was a good place to get to know others. And then because we found the church extremely friendly and engaging, we, we wanted just to learn more and know more. Right after we did Starting Point, they had the around the table lunch group. At the end of the lunch group, we said, let's form a life group. And we formed a life group, and that's become a part of our experience. And the second that you walk through the door, it's such a warm and caring environment. Everybody wants to share, so you get to know people pretty quickly. I had a really good experience. I got to learn a lot more staff. I felt welcome in the community, and now I was ready to pass my faith on. Starting point is appropriately named for that journey in becoming engaged at Menlo Church. So you can register at menlo.church slash starting point and look forward to seeing some of you there. Well, this weekend in our nation, we remember the work of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., And he was a civil rights leader who's also a a Christian minister, a pastor, and was deeply motivated by his faith in breaking down barriers, walls of of discrimination or injustice uh, in society. And uh, he often quoted the Bible in his many talks, even when he accepted the Nobel Peace Prize in 1964. He was reading from scripture because that uh, that, that inspired him to do that work. He dreamed of a day when all people would dwell together in, in unity, and as he famously said, where people would be judged not on the color of their skin, but on the content of their character. And here we are more than half a century after that, uh, as a church, continuing that work of Christ to be people who work for reconciliation, reconciliation between God and people, but also reconciliation between people, because we are citizens of a kingdom where there is no longer slave or free, Jew or Gentile, male or female, all are one in Christ Jesus. And so we are instruments of God's justice and love and peace in this world. And not as a political agenda, but as a gospel agenda to proclaim the good news of God's kingdom. And one way we participate in that work today is simply through our tithes and offerings. Whenever we give, Uh, We are participating in the church's work of reconciliation and bringing hope and restoration and justice uh, in this world in the name of Jesus Christ. So thanks for your generosity. If you give uh, online, which is what my family does, we just have a debit every 
two, twice a month that comes out, and uh, or you give by text or cash or check. Uh, thank you for your generosity in participating in the reconciling work of the church in the world today. Well, in a moment, Scott Palmwish is going to come and share God's word from us, continuing our series on hearing God. But before that, we're going to go into prayer. But I want to create a little bit of space before I lead us in prayer, because if you're like me, often you have your kind of laundry list. Okay, okay, God, I got a minute here. I got to pray. Here's the things I got to tell you about really quick. I need da 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 and then I got to go on to the next thing. And um, I just want to take a little space. So uh, we're going to have a moment of silence, and then I'm going to lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you are here. Thank you for your promise that where two or three are gathered in your name, Lord Jesus, you are in their midst. And God, forgive us when we are so busy in our schedules, so distracted by the things outside of us or distracted by all the voices with, within us of our own thoughts and feelings that we, that we don't recognize that you are with us. You are with us. And so in this moment, we lift our prayers to you. Prayers for ourselves, our own lives, whatever we're going through, God, you know it. You know what we need. Prayers for those we, we care about, but we don't know how to help, but God, you can. We lift those prayers to you. Prayers for our world, whether it's those impacted by the, the flooding and heavy rains in this state or war and violence and elsewhere around the world, we pray for you to intercede in ways that we cannot directly. And now, God, open our hearts and minds to hear you, to listen for your voice as Scott preaches, as your word is, is read and taught. Help us to listen for your still, small voice speaking to us today because you are living and active and at work. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, everybody, great to see you. Glad for those in this room and those joining us online. Um, excited for today and, uh, and what God might say to us in our sermon. Um, my name's Scott. I'm one of the pastors here. And we are learning together about how to hear God. We often talk a lot about prayer and about saying things to God, but does God respond? Can we actually hear what he has to say to us, and more specifically, to you? And that's the question of the day. Have you ever heard God's voice in your life? Um, what did it sound like? Was it like a James Earl Jones, you know, kind of deep, you know, this, I am the Lord, how are you? Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I have set my Bible app to the UK version because somehow the British accent really, you know, helps my understanding and uh, reverence for the Bible. I don't know, accents, you know, how we hear things can change it, but um, maybe, maybe God has spoken to you in a more creative way. Uh, I used to see these billboards around. I don't know if you've ever seen them. Uh, this one you have to think about a little bit. Um, maybe God spoke to you that way, or maybe he said, um, you know, something else. Maybe he said, I love you. That's a nice billboard, right? That, God, are you saying that to me? And um, maybe this one. Um, you know, it's a good, it's a pretty good book. Uh, but 
Uh, and, and that bestseller is, uh, is what we're going to focus on today, the Bible. How do we hear God in the, word, in the, in the, in the words printed in the Bible? Um, last week, Cheryl reminded us how to hear God, uh, to hear God, that we actually need to listen. We need to offer some space and uh, open our hearts and minds up to what God might say. As it turns out, that's harder than it seems. So we practiced a little bit. We had a little bit of silence before we went into communion last week. Now today, uh, we're going to consider how God speaks to us through this gift of the Bible and how, it can, how we can stay grounded as we listen for God's words in our lives. And to get started, we need to talk about what the Bible actually is. What we know of God comes from what God reveals to us. The Bible is a book of revelation. It gives us a picture of God in a variety of ways. The scriptures are therefore sometimes referred to as the word of God. You might remember the song when you were a kid. If you grew up in the church, Jesus loves me, this I know. Pretty good choir to the morning, this morning, okay? For the Bible tells me so. Um, yes, we know that God loves us because the Bible tells us so. Now, there's probably a little more to it, right? But when we say the Bible is the word of God, we mean that the scriptures are unique because, they, because God has revealed himself in these texts in a special and remarkable way. The Holy Spirit, through a process involving human authors, brought together oral tradition, history, law, poetry, prophecy, and correspondence in a way that reveals the character and purposes of God in an unparalleled and miraculous way. Taken as a whole, we get a picture of God and God's interactions with humanity. And like the way a great biography can make you feel like you know someone, Scripture draws us into God's story and our place in it. So the primary purpose of the Bible is to reveal God to us. At the same time, we also find instructions on how we are supposed to interact with God. It says in 2 Timothy, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching and rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That first line that reminds us that scripture is God-breathed, is spirit-infused. And that means we need to make sure that God is involved in the way that we read it. If we don't keep the focus of scripture on God, we can miss the point. And not only that, we can miss what God wants to say. It can even be harmful if we're not careful. And we must be honest and thoughtful when we read the scriptures because the Bible has been used to justify things that are not what God wants to do, but what we want to do. It is really easy to read ourselves into the story of scripture. This weekend, as we mentioned, we, we celebrate and remember the legacy and teaching of Dr. Martin Luther King. And Dr. King wrote this. He said, there is always the danger that religion and the Bible, not properly interpreted, can be used as forces to crystallize the status quo. You know, history is full of examples of how the Bible's been used to justify the objectification and abuse of people. And it, it's amazing how often the status quo fits our agenda and our way of life. I mean, we can marvel at the fact that it was possible to read the Bible in a way that affirmed slavery as something that God ordained. But for those who benefited from the life that slavery made possible, it was easy to hear it that way. It can be very tempting to read and hear the words of Scripture in a way that affirms our way of life rather than challenges it. If God seems to agree with everything that you're doing, you should be concerned or as Tim Keller puts it, if your God never disagrees with you, you might just be worshiping an idealized version of yourself. Here's how it's addressed in Hebrews. 
For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. When we read the Bible properly, there will be conviction. It will reveal things about my true heart and intention. It will push me toward change. It will challenge my assumptions. And this is part of what makes hearing God through Scripture a challenge. Is this actually what God wants? Is this actually a word from God? Or is it my subconscious desires and unhealthy patterns or unmet aspirations that are coming through? There are powerful things at work in my mind and heart that do not want to submit to God. And there is an enemy that is encouraging that line of thinking. The Apostle Paul acknowledges this struggle in his own life, saying in Romans 7, For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. Yes, God, I want to follow that. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. You know, when I've heard the voice of God in my life, it sounds suspiciously like my own voice. And some of the time I know it's God speaking through my voice, but some of the time I wonder, how do I know if this is really you, Lord, or if this is just what I want you to say? Well, our friend Dallas Willard has a little question that helps us maybe get to the bottom of that. He offers this thought. The test is, is this serving what I want or what God wants? This question breaks down the tendency to try to control the word of God. When living in a conversational relationship with God, we have to let go of our efforts to manipulate him or others. Our only protection from our own pride, fear, ignorance, and impatience as we study the Bible is fellowship with the living word, the Lord himself, Jesus Christ, invoked in constant supplication in the midst of his people. Now we're going to talk about the importance of community, of hearing that in the midst of God's people next week. But the crucial question of, is this what I want or what God wants is really important for us to focus on today. And the best way, says Willard, to get a sense of what God wants is to be in a relationship with him to know his heart, to experience his presence, to stay connected in prayer. Because we hear things differently when we are close relationally. I found this to be true in my marriage. Uh, when my wife and I have conflicts, I mean, you know, once in a great while when that ever happens, it's usually because there's been a period ahead of that where we've lost close connection in our relationship. Because then I start hearing things differently when uh, an honest question all of a sudden becomes an accusation. <laughs> a casual comment feels dismissive. A simple observation feels like criticism. Anybody relate to that? Has that ever happened to you? So we have to keep that in mind when we read the Bible. What we hear from God when we read the Bible is connected to the state of our relationship with Jesus Christ. So we need to be close. Sometimes um, we look at the Bible like a recipe book or an owner's manual. You know, it stays on the shelf until I need something and then I pull it off. And I know nobody has books anymore. You do everything online and Google it. But let's, for the sake of this illustration, imagine you're pulling a, a manual off the shelf. Um, and it contains, um, this manual contains the perfect answer to every possible question or issue I face in life, covering all subjects, science, economics, health, politics, romance, on and on. But the Bible is not a textbook that gives us answers to every question in life. If it did, we would worship the Bible and not the God it reveals. We want answers because, if we're honest, we want control. And the Bible can present us sometimes with as many questions as it does answers. But 
it will always point us to Jesus. It will always point us to Jesus. And Jesus doesn't give us a blueprint. He says, come and follow me. Now, we can find direction in Scripture, and there are instructions and commandments, and studying the Bible and uncovering the depths of meaning are a good thing. Don't hear what I'm not saying here. They are really important. And we have groups and ministries that focus on studying Scripture. But the Scriptures not only tell you what to do or how to behave, they tell you who you are. We need God's voice in our engagement with Scripture. Otherwise, the Christian life ends up as mostly knowing about God rather than knowing God personally. And if you want to hear his voice in your life, you need to know him personally. Now, last week, Cheryl gave us uh, four guardrails about listening. And, And this week, I want to offer three postures that will help you hear from God as you listen and and read the scriptures. Listen to and read the scriptures. And here it is. We need to listen prayerfully, expectantly, and regularly. Okay? Prayerfully. Listening to the Bible prayerfully means that I invite the Holy Spirit to take part in my reading and understanding. Sometimes we forget that if we know Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God is living inside of you, illuminating, moving our hearts, sometimes convicting us. Jesus told his disciples, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. He will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine, and that's why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. The Spirit will make known to you what the Spirit gets from Jesus. That voice in your head is the Spirit. Now, maybe you've experienced this if you've ever uh, been led to a certain verse or you've been reading uh, a passage of the Bible. Ever had this happen to you where you've uh, been reading and a verse just pops out of your, or or a, 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 a just a word on the page, just like it's neon, and all of a sudden you're like, "That was for me, God. You gave that for me." Um, Think of how differently uh, you can hear something. Sometimes the words written on a page can communicate very different things depending on how they're said, what kind of inflection, right? Um, Have you ever written something that was misinterpreted? Once in a while, maybe, had to go back and say it differently. Now, our new senior pastor, Phil, uh, has been teaching me something new. Phil loves to send audio messages and... uh, I, I didn't know, uh, you know, we could do this on my phone, but apparently you can. You can just, rather than typing things out with your thumbs, um, you can actually just hold, something, uh, hold the button down and record your voice and send it. I know. All, anybody under 50 is going, yeah, Scott, that's really obvious, but not to me. And so I write out my texts like, like an old guy, but I asked Phil, why do you, why do you, why do, you do the recording? And can you, can you guess why? Well, part of it is there's a lot less chance that it gets miscommunicated because when you speak something, you say it in a certain way, right? With a certain inflection and a certain tone and a certain, all that. And that enables you to hear something very differently. And so it it helps him to not get misconstrued. And he also admitted it's a lot easier, which I'm trying to (laughs) embrace. Now, we can use punctuation with, our, with the written word, right? Um, we can write our text in all caps. Stop yelling at me, right? Um, but there are limits to the written word. And here's the thing. The Spirit, the Spirit of God living in you, if you know Jesus, will help you discern and hear things the way God wants you to hear them. I've had numerous occasions where I've walked out of a sermon and someone came and asked me about a certain phrase or thing that I said that wasn't actually in the sermon. Yet somehow, the Holy Spirit worked between my words 
and their ears or your ears so that you can hear what you need to hear from God. That is the word preached and the spirit involved. So when we hear the words of scripture, we hear them through the Holy Spirit, adding tone and color to the words. Second thing, second posture we need is to listen expectantly. What am I hoping to hear from God? Do I actually hope to hear from God? Do I want God to speak to me? What questions am I coming to God with? Because when you're asking God to speak to you through the words of Scripture, it actually helps to expect to hear from God. I know that sounds obvious, but sometimes we miss it. Sometimes we miss it. We're just not really expecting to hear from God. Uh, Eugene Peterson, uh, who I'm going to quote heavily here, has uh, written a book called Eat This Book. Um, And it's about reading reading the Bible. And he says this, we do not read this book and the subsequent writings that are shaped by it in order to find out how to get God into our lives, get him to participate in our lives. No, we open this book and find that page after page, it takes us off guard. It surprises us and draws us into its reality and pulls us into participation with God on his terms. I love that line. It, it surprises us. It catches us off guard and draws us into reality. It's, it's alive, it's living, it's, it has something to say to us. Do we expect it to do that? We need to read for discovery like it's a love letter. that We savor every word. I might have mentioned this before, but I lost my father um, to cancer in, in March. And uh, as my sisters and I were, were gathered around his bedside before he passed, um, we... Uh, we had a lot of great family time, but one of the things that we, we discovered was this box of letters that my grandmother had recently, uh, that had come from my grandmother's house, it, it recently showed up in the garage, and I'd never seen this box before, I never read those letters, and so we were, you know, my sisters and I were sitting around the table, and we started pulling out these letters that had been sitting there, and they were handwritten letters that my dad had sent, sent home when he was in, in the Vietnam War. They were full of honest emotion and funny stories and heartbreaking experiences. He talked about the the humidity and the conditions at the base, who he was meeting and the kinds of missions he was flying. He was a pilot. And he also shared his opinions about the guy his sister was dating, who later became my uncle. Um, (laughs) Say my dad was a very protective uh, older brother. We'll just say that. Um, He shared his feelings about the war and his hopes to come home. Now, by the time um, we got to those letters, my dad really wasn't able to interact with us very much. But uh, through that writing, through those letters, I felt like I got to know him. I got to know him in a deeper way. I got to see a side of him I didn't know was there. And the Bible, when we read it expectantly, can open up who God is, who God wants to be in our lives in a whole new way. Peterson gets the title of his book, Eat This Book, uh, from this scripture uh, in Revelation. It says this, so I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth, it will be as sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. The angel's command here is an invitation. Come to the table, eat this book, for every word in the book is intended to do something in us. Give us health and wholeness, vitality and holiness in our soul and body. But Peterson warns us that reading also carries with it subtle dangers Passionate words of men and women spoken in ecstasy can end up flattened on the page and dissected with an impersonal eye. Wild words wrung out of excruciating suffering can be skinned and stuffed and mounted and labeled as museum specimens. I mean, we can read the Bible as this dead thing. Like the frog you dissected in high school, we can pick it apart until it no longer has any wonder 
We can squeeze it into 20 tips or five ways or how to do this or that. The Bible contains some guidance, but we don't want to flatten it into this boring thing. It is a wild ride. And Peterson goes on and says, uh, says, eat this book. It will be as sweet as honey in your mouth, but it will also be bitter to your stomach. You can't reduce this book to what you can handle. You can't domesticate this book to what you're comfortable with. You can't make it your toy poodle trained to respond to your commands. Eat this book, but also, and I love this line, have a well-stocked cupboard of Alka-Seltzer and Pepto-Bismol at hand. What do you expect when you read? Do you read it with imagination and wonder? Because if you do, it can speak to you throughout your entire life, whatever situation you find yourself in. New convictions and growth, new places of intimacy and connection, new guidance and hope. What a ride! Can we read and approach the Bible like that? Last posture. Listen regularly. Regularly. Jesus answered uh, when he was being tempted in the desert. He answered Satan. He said, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. God's words are what we live on. Reading, interpreting, and living by God's word is as essential as daily food and drink. Jesus himself indicates the significance of applying God's word to our lives as he needed it. And we should always instinct, we know instinctively to eat and drink, right? Can we apply that to scripture? Christians feed on scripture. Holy scripture nurtures the holy community as food nurtures the human body. Christians don't simply learn or study or use scripture, we assimilate it. We take it into our lives in such a way that it gets metabolized into acts of love, cups of cold water, missions into all the world, healing and evangelism and justice in Jesus' name, hands raised in the adoration of the Father, feet washed in the company of the Son. That's the word poured in, eaten, metabolized. I tend to eat regularly, probably too regularly. We need to hear God and listen to him regularly, especially in the words of scripture. Um, Joshua 1.8 says this, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that was written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. And Psalm 1, if you know it, echoes this very idea. Delighting in the words of Scripture day and night will tune our hearts and minds to hear the voice of God in the midst of the noise of our world. And as we said earlier, the voices of the enemy. And I would invite you, a further step is to take Scripture and memorize it. That's another way to metabolize it, to have it in your, in your mind at, at, at just... You can recall those words when you need them, when those voices invade. When I am worried, when I feel like a failure, when I wonder if I have enough, I can remember words, the words that are in the text, the Lord is my shepherd. The Father knows your needs. Take heart, I have overcome the world. When those verses are in your heart, they will speak to you when you need them. Do you know that it's kind of a miracle that we can pick out a voice in a crowded room? Uh, From the third trimester of pregnancy, a baby knows the sound of its mother. From our earliest days, our brains and our ears are tuned to hear certain voices. Now, I have a mother who loves sports and has always been my biggest fan. Um, She is not afraid to cheer with gusto at any sporting event and at times express her opinions about the refing at that sporting event. (laughs) Love my mom. Um, I could pick out my mom's voice in a crowd of a thousand people a hundred yards away. I can hear her voice cheering me on. I could hear it when I was a kid and I can hear it today. My ears are tuned. 
You want to tune your ears so you can hear the Father. And to do that, you need to practice. So we're going to take a minute and practice. Um, our practice for this series, uh, th or this um, sermon today, this week, is Lectio Divina. And what that means, it's just holy reading or divine reading, um, spiritual reading. And the idea is that we read attentively, that we read prayerfully, and we listen for what God might want to say. And this is different than reading for uh, study or content. This is reading for conversation. Um, and we have this practice. You can, you can find the, the uh, instructions online if you want to do this during the week. But what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going I'm to read this passage twice. And the idea is that the words as you listen to them will kind of descend kind of out of your head and kind of move down towards your heart. And what I want you to do is just kind of, kind of just relax, find a, a, a comfortable position, okay? Take a, take a deep breath, posture of receptivity, okay? And just listen, what might you wanna say to me right now, God, in this space? No pressure to hear anything, just be present. Here we go, Romans 15, four through seven. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. Now, as I read it again, just listen for a phrase or a word or something that pops out at you or that you feel like God is saying to you. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. Lord, you know our hearts and you know what we needed to hear from you today. I pray that you said what you needed to say through the spirit, through the words of this text. And I pray that each person as they've heard what you have said to them um, would have the courage, Lord, to receive it to act on it, that it would do the work that you intend, whether it's encouragement or instruction or conviction. I pray that any encouragement would go deep, that we continue to open our ears 
and our hearts to hear your words to us. Thank you for the gift of the scriptures, but even more for the gift of your life, your presence in our lives. Thank you that we are your creation and that you want to speak to us and you love us. And for that, we are all grateful. And we pray that in Jesus' precious name, amen. continue just to enjoy the presence of God. Ask him to make us even more aware of his presence with us. Allow him to continue to speak to you even through this song.
you for your presence with us, God, for your voice.
What a good word to go out on, just our reliance on God's promise, a God who is living and active and still speaks and still works in our lives and in the world today. And uh, whether you're in this room, you're watching online, I want to invite you to take part in the ministry of prayer. You can uh, fill out a prayer card uh, that's in the back of the pews, put those in the offering boxes. You can go to uh, menlo.church slash prayer online. And we also have folks from our prayer team up at the front here to, to pray with you for anything at all. Now, as you go out into uh, the rest of this day, the rest of this week, every conversation, every moment that God leads you into, may you make space. My hope is you will make space to listen regularly, expectantly, prayerfully. And as you go, may the presence of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you. And God's people said, amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. And if you need any prayer or support this week, feel free to reach out to me and our team here at 650-600-0402. Make sure before you go that you check out our Menlo podcast so you can get not only the sermon, the midweek, and our new podcast with Phil. And again, if you have trouble hearing God, if you want to continue this practice with us, if you need support, I'd love to be that resource for you. Have a wonderful week, and I will see you soon. Another doomsday news cycle spinning with all the negativity. Don't forget you can shut it off. Try to catch your mind when it runs. Easier said than done. Can I get an amen? amen? This is where life is coming at you. Hands up. Here's your anthem.